So in this video, we're going to be talking about disorders of the eyes. At first, we're going to look at a few things about sensory receptors and sensation. So there's general senses and there's the special senses, and that includes the eye and ear, which is really the topic of um, this unit in pathology. We can have extra receptors, which are um, monitoring what's happening outside of the body. There's visceral receptors that are inside the body. There's proprioceptors that are body position, so that's in the muscles and the joints. We can look at them by the type of stimuli, mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors, thermoreceptors. Photoreceptors are what this one's about. Nociroceptors are pain, um, which we talked about last, um, last semester. Osmoreceptors or osmolarity, we talked a little bit about that. So those are kind of chemoreceptors. So <clears throat> a brief uh, review of the anatomy and the physiology of the eye so that we can talk about what can go wrong. So light enters into the eye through the cornea, which is the clear front part of the eye. From the cornea, it passes through the lens and an image is formed on the retina, on the back of the eye. <clears throat> there are special receptors, photoreceptors, back there. There's the rods and the cones. Rods respond to black and white vision. Cones, um, there's three different types of cones and they each respond to a color and so they are responsible for color vision. Now, the image that's on the back of the eye ends up being inverted um, and backwards, just by the nature of the lens. <clears throat> now, the stimuli that from the rods and the cones and the patterns on the rods and the cones pass through the optic nerve, which is a cranial nerve, cranial nerve 2, and then goes back to the occipital lobe of the of the brain of the cerebral cortex the image that appears back there gets interpreted and processed by the associate association areas of the brain the visual association areas and so meaning is given to the images in other parts of the brain so but information goes from the retina to the occipital lobe and then from the occipital lobe to other parts of the brain for interpretation <clears throat> the eyeball itself has the orbit that it sits in and this gives bony protection to the eye because it's a delicate structure um, the eyelids and eyelashes are, are to deflect any foreign material from coming into the eye, from the cornea drying out, from excessive sunlight, that's what eyelashes are for. There's a mucosal lining of the eyelid and it covers the white of the eye, it's called the conjunctiva. We produce tears by glands that secrete onto the eyeball. Uh, there's antibacterial enzymes in those chairs, so not only uh, do they lubricate and keep the eyes from drying, they also have an antimicrobial property. The eye is controlled by six extra orbital muscles. It says here they're controlled by cranial nerves three and four, but it's three, four, and six. So that's the ocular motor, the trochlear, and the abducens uh, nerves do it. The abducens abducts the eye, so it, it makes you the eyeball move laterally. The trochlear controls the, um, the superior oblique, so it makes you look down and out, and the op ocular motor 
control the other four. The eyeball itself has a, it says touch, it means tough fibrous coat. Um, it's a dense, irregular connective tissue, lots of collagen fibers in it. Um, the white of the eye is called the sclera. The transparent portion in the front is called the cornea. It is largely extracellular connective tissue. It's more matrix than anything else. It's transparent, light can go through it, um, and it refracts light like, like a lens does. Um, it is avascular. Um, there's no blood vessels. If there was blood vessels in the cornea, you would, you would see them. Uh, it would affect the transparency. Um, so, but these cells need to have nutrients. So the nutrients come from the fluids that are in the eyeball itself. Um, the surface of the eyeball, of the cornea, actually gets oxygen diffusing through the, the wetness of the eye itself. It's one of the reasons why leaving contact lenses in too long uh, can be harmful. Modern contact lenses allow oxygen to pass through them more than the old ones did, but nevertheless, um, it's not about drying out, it's about lack of oxygen to getting to those cells. The uvea is the, the middle layer. It's the, uh, the choroid layer, and that's the vascular layer just inside the sclera. It's dark so that it absorbs any scattered light so that, so that stray light coming through the eyeball through the lens doesn't distort the image does it it, it blackens um, uh, in the front of the eyeball is um, is the iris right, and the ciliary body and the ciliary body controls the shape of the lens to to accommodate for focus um, so that when the little muscles of the, um, the ciliary body pull on the lens, the lens lengthens and flattens, and when they relax, the lens shortens and gets wider. Um, the iris is a smooth muscle, it's pigmented, uh, it's what gives the color to the eye, Sympathetic causes dilation uh, of the pupil, so it makes the pupil bigger. Uh, and uh, parasympathetic causes constriction. The retina is the uh, neural part. It's the part where the photoreceptor cells, the rods and cones are. Uh, it's multi-layered. It's in the back of the eyeball. Um, in the center of this retina is an area called the fovea centralis. This is where really acute vision happens. There are more rods in the rest of the, in the, in the rest of the retina. In the fovea, it's packed with cones so that you can have really acute vision. And this is whatever you are looking at. Uh, so as you read the slide here and you look at this video, you're using this fovea to actually distinguish the, the contours of the letters. So a pretty simple map here of this. So the cornea runs from here to here. It's clear. Um, the lens is really a crystalline connective tissue that's transparent. Uh, 
is suspended here and here by the ciliary muscles that will pull on it to make it longer and narrower so that it changes the refraction. It changes the, um, the path of light through it because it changes these curves. The iris comes from here to here. Um, in through here is the canal of, Sh of Schlem. So the fluid that's in this space, in this anterior chamber, has the aqueous humor here. So we call the this anterior cavity filled with aqueous humor is divided into the anterior chamber in front of the iris and the posterior chamber behind the iris. The fluid is produced here in the ciliary bodies. There's blood vessels here that that are fenestrated and they leak and the fluid comes out and it circulates through here and then it's reabsorbed back to the bloodstream here through the canal of Schlem. And we're, we're going to see that this is important for things like glaucoma. Now, this posterior cavity here is, uh, is filled with vitreous humor. These are the layers. Um, right. The choroid, by the way, is um, will reflect light back out, and it, and because it's full of blood, it's red, and that's why you get red eye in um, in camera, or you see like the headlights will reflect off the lights of an oh, the eyeballs of an animal, and you you see them. Right in here is the optic disc. This is where the optic nerve exits the retina. There's a blind spot here. There's no, um, there's no rods and cones. Here, the fovea centralis is where most images that we focus on are formed. All the peripheral vision happens through this part. The sclera is, is uh, provided blood by the, this artery and vein, and it goes, and so is the retina. Like, so all of this is supplied by blood that comes through this, the center of the optic nerve, really. Okay. So in the posterior cavity is the vitreous humor. It's uh, not as watery and it doesn't get changed over as much because, because the walls of the, that part are actually supplied by blood. The anterior cavity is the aqueous humor, humor. and it's constantly being made and reabsorbed so that it is fresh with oxygen and nutrients all the time. And the pressure that's in this anterior cavity is called the normal intraocular pressure, IOP. You want that to be below 24 millimeters of mercury because if it's being made faster than it's being reabsorbed, or it's being reabsorbed slower than it's being made, the pressure builds up. So the light passes through the cornea and it refracts a little bit. It goes through the aqueous humor, through the pupil, then through the lens where it's going to, uh, it's going to refract some more, through the vitreous humor, and then it's going to be affecting the rods and the cones on the retina. They interact with the neurons of the 
optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two. And then the optic nerves go back to the brain where they meet at the optic chiasm. There, some of the fibers cross, so they go to each occipital lobe, right? Perception it happens in the association areas of the occipital lobe, in the visual parts of the brain. So this is what it looks like. So from the eyeball, this is the optic nerve, number one. This is the optic nerve on the left. Number two is the crossover. Now you'll notice that the lateral part of the retina stays on the same side here. So the lateral part of the right retina goes to the right occipital lobe. The lateral part of the left retina stays and goes to the left occipital lobe. Now, the medial side of the retinas, so here, the medial side of the left retina passes through the optic nerve, the left optic nerve, goes through the chiasm, crosses over, and goes to the right occipital lobe. And the same with the medial side of the right, goes through the right nerve, crosses over the chiasm, and goes to the left occipital lobe. So that what we have is the field of vision from over here is striking the medial side of the left eye. So an image to the left strikes the medial side of the left eye and the lateral side of the right eye, and they both end up being processed together in the right occipital lobe. Something to your, the left will hit the medial right, the lateral left, and be processed on the left side. Cool? So there can be neurological damage. So if the optic nerve is damaged here, it will make all the information from that right eye not get to the brain. So you will be damaged in the right eye or the right optic nerve, you'll be blind in the right eye and the left eye will be functioning. If you have damage to the chiasm, you're blind in both eyes. If you have, these are called the optic tracts because they are tracts within the brain itself. If you have damage to the occipital lobe or the optic tract on the um, right side, then you will lose half the field of vision from both eyes. And the same on the other, you would lose half from both. So sometimes people have strokes or sometimes they, they have damage in these different places and it leads to different visual impairments. So you've all used visual acuity charts uh, with the big letter and they get progressively smaller. You, you understand that. Right, we use that all the time to make sure that the, the refractions are right and that the image ends up focusing on the retina. If the image focuses before the retina or after the retina, it's going to be not clear. And so then we can use a, another lens to change that and make it more acuity. The visual field test, you've all done this, where you, uh, the little lights flash and then we're looking for, for peripheral and central vision problems. So seeing if there's macular degeneration or seeing if there's 
other problems in the field of vision. Tonometry is, look at that, it says tone. We're looking for the pressure in the intraocular pressure. This is used to uh, look for glaucoma. Ophthalmoscopes, you look through the eye to ex examine the retina and look for the structures. You can see the fovea, you can see the, the blind spot, you can see the blood vessels, right? Ganioscopy, ganio means angle. A ganiometer measures the angles of joints. A ganioscope measures the angle of the anterior chamber. So it's the corner where that canal of uh, Schlem is, where that fluid gets reabsorbed back to the bloodstream. And there are muscle function and coordination tests where it's looking at tracking of the eyeballs together. Oftentimes people with um, concussions have trouble with this muscular function and coordination. Um, and it can be quite rough on people. Okay, so if for some reason the image is focused in front of the retina, so the refraction through the cornea and the refraction through the lens means that the image comes together in front of the retina. We call that myopia or nearsightedness. So in order to see something, you have to have it right up close. Uh, right? Hyperopia is farsighted. So the image is trying to focus behind the retina. So, myopia, less, nearsighted, hyperopia, farsighted. Presbyopia is, uh, is a farsightedness, and it's got to do with aging. As we age, the lens becomes less elastic and can't accommodate. So it, it hardens in a distance thing. So that we end up with farsightedness, that we end up with only images far away. Um, focusing. So if we look at this, so without looking at the corrective lens here, this is myopia. What would normally happen is without the correction, it's the red line. And the image will focus through the cornea and through the lens to a point here in front of the retina. And so it will be blurry by the time it goes to the retina because these lines will spread again. So by using a corrective lens, what we'll do is we change the angle of the light out so that it's hitting so that when the cornea and the lens bend it in, it focuses back on the retina. So for nearsighted, we need these biconcave lenses. For farsightedness, so that means there's not enough refraction through the lens here. And so the image would, would come together after. It's too spread out here. So it's blurred at the retina. By having a biconvex lens, the light will focus to a point. Um, and to illustrate this, you've probably all played with a magnifying glass and the sun and trying to get a, a point of light. So you move the lens up and down until you get the point of light right on whatever you're trying to burn. Um, to do that, you use biconvex lenses. And that distance is the focal distance of the, of the lens. And you'll see that it's very similar to the shape of the lens that's in the eyeball. Sometimes the cornea has an irregular curvature. So the curve in the uh, 
superior inferior direction is not the same as in the medial lateral direction. And that's called an astigmatism. And so in an irregular curvature like this means that you can accommodate in one plane but not in other planes. So when things move, they change focus. A strabismus uh, can be anything that's that's going to cause the eyes not to track properly. So cross-eyed. So if one eye deviates from the movement of the other, they're not going to be focusing on the same image at the same time. <coughs> and this can lead to something called diplopia, which is double vision. There could be a, a hypertonic muscle, could be a weak muscle, could be some neurological defect in one of the cranial nerves. So for instance, um, one of the, an early, a common early sign of multiple sclerosis is diplopia and a strabismus caused by um, the information coming through the cranial nerves at different speeds to the different eyes because the myelin sheath is gone on one side. Um, these weak or hypertonic muscles can be corrected with exercises and with, with things to do, um, or sometimes injections or, you know, or the neurological defect has to be investigated. We see this in a lot of children, about, uh, I think three out of 10 children have a little bit of a problem. And if it's not corrected, then the, as the child grows and develops, that muscle will stay in that in that wrong spot, and is very very difficult to correct. And they, you can end up with amblyopia. Think of amble as wandering, to amble around. So amblyopia is a lazy eye. It's yeah, and can result in diplopia. I just was talking to a friend of mine whose grandson has diplopia from a little bit of amblyopia that they didn't really notice. And he's quite a competitive hockey player. And he said to the specialist just like a couple of weeks ago when he finally got in to see somebody with COVID no, he's like, yeah, I always see two pucks, but I always choose the one on the right. Uh, doesn't everybody see two pucks? Pucks, you've got two eyes. He didn't understand that diplopia is not normal and he's adapted, which is crazy. So the strabismus is this um, wandering of, the, of one eye. Nystagmus is abnormal movement and it can be in one or both eyes. It can be caused by a number of different things, neurological causes, inner ear balance problems, uh, because if one ear is telling your brain your head's in one position and your other is not, telling it's a different position, your eyes try and correct that and will flutter back and forth. I saw this today in practice, uh, I did an, uh, an evaluation for vertigo with somebody and I did an Epsley maneuver with her. And she had nystagmus in her right eye because of this inner ear problem. Sometimes there's cerebellar disturbances. Drug toxicity is a big thing. Now, how this nystagmus works, we won't get into it because it's more neurological, but a vertical nystagmus going up and down is different than a horizontal nystagmus. Usually inner ear is horizontal. I've already talked about diplopia. So it could be a cranial nerve problem, could be paralysis of extraocular muscles, could be stroke. But what happens is you lose depth perception or and you see double. Sometimes you can get an infection 
in the hair follicle uh, of your on your eyelid of your eyelash usually it's a staph staphylococci uh, and you get this purulent exudate you get it fills with pus and it becomes a swollen red mass you can get uh, infections conjunctivitis is pink eye and this is usually a viral infection but can be a bacterial infection um, or it could just be irritation of the conjunctiva which is the inside of the eyelid or the part that covers the sclera the whites of the eyes um, trachoma uh, oh i've just lost it uh, it's a, it's an infection of the eye by uh, chlamydia that's what it is chlamydia trachomas and it's the same chlamydia that causes the sexually transmitted disease now it will cause a growth um, and can lead to blindness. We don't see it much here uh, in North America. A lot of third world countries, it matters. It, you, we see it when in crowded situations or where there's problems with sanitation and things like that. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it more in a minute. Keratitis is just like conjunctivitis except it's on it's on the cornea instead of over the sclera so here's a picture of a sty now um, my dad went in one time to have a sty removed and it turned out that it was uh, a lymphoma and it turned out to be cancerous uh, it just resemble this dye and that's just something to to think about because there's an awful lot of um, lymphoid tissue around the eyelid because it's a portal of entry into the body so uh, we need the lymphatic system and the immune system working there this is obviously the eyelid look at this growth it's it's covering the eye so this is a pretty bad version of it keratosis you see this this problem now um, this is also a conjunctivitis here but the keratosis is here now oftentimes a keratosis or keratitis right, rather would be uh, can leave a little ulceration on the eye and it's often a herpes simplex. It's the same as a cold sore. Um, we see it in pets. Years ago, I had a cat that ended up with a keratitis, an ulcer right on the cornea. And we had to pack it full of antibiotics and deal with it that way. And then you can't put a patch on the eye of a cat. So they actually sewed his eyelids closed uh, until it was they just sutured it closed now interestingly enough my son's dog is we're putting drops in her eyes right now for a keratitis it happens in people way more than you think a lot of people think well it's it could be you know it's pink eye and they put home drops in it because you, you end up with usually with this pink eye involvement this um but you can see where the vascularization ends here in the conjunctiva and there's this part is avascular the big fear of this is that these ulcerations or, or the inflammation of the cornea can actually result in scar tissue which is not transparent and it can lead to a clouded eye or to um, um, to blindness I knew a guy when I was in high school he had a smoky eye or 
we used to, it's, it's often called a walleye. And what happened with him is that he got shot with a pellet gun. They were fooling around and, and the pellet hit him, uh, the ricocheted back and the pellet hit him right on the eye and damaged his cornea. And because he was doing what he wasn't supposed to do, he didn't tell anybody until the scar tissue had set up and he had permanent damage. Sometimes you see it in people that, you know, get sand or dirt or things in the eye. It has to be treated. And it, not as a medical emergency, but next best thing to an emergency because it can lead to permanent blindness. So the conjunctivitis is an inflammation could be a, an infection could be just be allergens right you get redness itching excessive tearing it's the conjunctivite it's the lining of the eyelids and the superficial part of the uh, of the sclera if it's staph aureus which is a common thing uh, it's pink eye it can it easily transfers because of the purulent discharge. You get it on your fingers, so you rub your eye, you touch your other eye, it can, it can pass. It can uh, be spread by contaminated towels. Um, a lot of people get it because of contact lens use. They don't clean their hands before they put the contact lens in, or they reuse the lens too often, or a lot of times people Old makeup, it's the reason you have to throw away old makeup because the oils in it can, you know, can be a petri dish for staphylococcus and contaminated eye makeup can get in and cause pink eye. We want to use antibiotics because staph is a bacteria. And you've all seen it, it looks like this. Chlamydia will do it. Gonorrhea, that's your gonococci, will do it. Both of these things will cause sexually transmitted infections. Um, and a lot of times newborns, as they pass through the birth canal, if the mother has chlamydia or gonorrhea, will infect the eyes of the newborn. Um, for the longest time in Ontario, um, newborns all got silver nitrate drops put in their eyes, which literally burnt off the outer layer of the uh, cornea to prevent this from happening. And it was the law. Every child had it. This is what gonococcal conjunctivitis looks like. So this is an interesting slide here. This is a used contact lens, soft contact lens, that's in a Petri dish and then cultured. And look at the pseudomonas that is growing off of that lens into the Petri dish. So if we look at uh, the different things that can be on, on contact lenses. Please, you're not going to memorize this, but the point of this is the colorfulness. It's look how many different things there are. So the Pseudomonas, 18%. Clibicella uh, is the 9%. Staph is that 4%. Streptomonas, 7%. You know, all of these things. If you look at the other, that's gram-positive bacteria, which is about 3%, and the gram-negative bacteria is 35%. And that's non-specific. So there's others that, that happen here. So what this is saying is that contact lenses and contact lens solutions can be real carriers of these bacteria that can cause these infections. That's why it's critical to be cleaning and replacing the lenses uh, as, 
as often as possible, making sure your hands are clean, and making sure that your solutions aren't old and that they're properly stored. Now, think about this. Most of us store our contact solutions in the bathroom. And how much stuff comes into the air in the bathroom? How many bacteria just from normal functioning at the toilet? So, chlamydia causes, causes this trachoma, because it's chlamydia trachomatis. Um, what happens here is there are follicles on the inner surface of the eyelids. And literally, it, there are these growths. It gives it this scratchy eye. Luckily, it's, a, uh, it's easily treated with antibiotics when it's found. But it's, we, we, ne we hardly ever see it here, but internationally, it's the most common cause of vision loss. Inadequate hygiene is really a lot of the problem. Right? And they can lead to a loss of transparency because it, it will scar up the, uh, the cornea because every time you blink, it will scratch and abrade the cornea. So keratitis uh, develops when the cornea is irritated, could be infected. Herpes is a big uh, thing. A lot of it comes from lesions around the mouth. So you have a, a, a sore, a cold sore, and you scratch it and then you rub your eye. Um, you can cause it. Um, the risk is ul ulceration because this is avascular and so it, the healing is difficult there. And if you get scar tissue, it interferes with vision. Um, direct trauma to the cornea can do it. Uh, and they think that's what happened with, with my son's dog. Uh, luckily, she seems to be responding because the dog ophthalmologist in um, in Toronto, can't see her until August. Um, so this is chemical splashes and, you know, could be just fumes can cause this kind of thing industrially. This is the reason that you wear protective lenses, you know, especially in labs and things like that. Glaucoma is increased intraocular pressure. So this is because aqueous humor is accumulating. So it's either being uh, created too quickly or it's being absorbed, reabsorbed too slowly. It's common, it's preventable. Uh, you, know, you can get acute or chronic versions. If it happens, it changes the it changes the shape of the cornea because the pressure pushes the cornea out, which means that we don't, you get a slightly blurred vision. So you get halos uh, around lights at night because the point of light is spread over a greater part of the retina. Uh, we'll lose peripheral vision. Um, it has to be really greatly increased for it to be painful. So uh, acute is when the angle between the cornea and the iris is decreased and there's not enough room through the canal of Schlem to, uh, for the reabsorption to effectively happen. Um, so it could be caused by just aging, some scar tissue from trauma, so, so things like that. If the iris gets the iris gets pushed forward, then it's going to close off that angle uh, and block the outflow of the aqueous humor, and you get this increased interocular pressure. Uh, sometimes, as the 
if the pupil is constricted, it's parasympathetic, pupil dilation, the sympathetics, the, 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 um, by dilating the pupil, you're kind of bunching up um, the, the iris and closing off that gap. Treatments usually are about uh, relaxing and you know, causing, try and increase that flow. Surgery might be necessary. Chronic open angle glaucoma is more a disease of aging. And, um, and it really has to do with vascular changes that come with aging. And so the trabecular network, the, the blood vessels that allow the reabsorption of the liquid is impaired. So it's not that the, the liquid can't get there, the angle is still open, but it's not being absorbed because of vascular issues there. It's insidious. The pressure increases slowly over time. Um, you know, it can cause by, it can cause blindness. You treat it by administering drops that cause those capillaries to absorb more. So if we look close up here, this is the cornea. This is the anterior chamber. This is the iris. The fluid is made in this ciliary body, passes in front of the lens, and then accumulates in here. Then it's reabsorbed by being pulled into here, into this trabecular network, and it gets reabsorbed here. So if this gets pushed forward, there's not enough space. Or if there's a problem with the degeneration of the trabecular network, then it can't absorb. And so the fluid builds up here in that anterior chamber. If there's some sort of a problem here, then the canal gets too narrow and there's, it blocks the drainage. Cataracts is opacity, it's clouding of the lens. So it's going to interfere with light transmission. Um, the whole lens could be clouded, it could be little parts of the lens be, be cloud. Uh, it's age related, often metabolic abnormalities. Um, I think diabetes is a big problem. Excessive exposure to sunlight uh, is a big problem. Um, this is why wearing decent sunglasses, if you're going to be out a lot. Um, people who weld a lot, especially if they weren't careful, can end up with this. People, uh, glass blowers typically get a problem because not only is there the brightness of the looking at the glass in the furnace, uh, but there's heat as well. It could be congenital issues, could be traumatic issues, like literally, you know, people who box often end up with cataracts. All of these factors are hard to, uh, to control. Nobody looks for trauma. We all love to be out in the sun. Well, um, excessive exposure to sunlight. So it's one thing if you're outside, you know, all summer long and you're not wearing sunglasses. It's a whole other thing if you're sailing, for instance, and the light reflects off the white sails and the white deck and the water, right? Or if you're a skier or a mountain climber, you know, it's why you want to wear UV protective things. None of us can do anything about aging, 
but you can do, you know, you can watch your metabolic um, things, try and control blood sugars, etc. So this is what a cataract looks like. You can see it right in the lens here. Um, this person often, obviously has been given a midriatic, which is a drug that causes the pupil to dilate uh, so that you can see this. You can see by the light that that would normally cause constriction of the pupil. Vision becomes blurred and darker. Uh, both eyes are not necessarily the same. Um, and what they do is they literally cut the lens out and replace it with a glass or plastic version, which fixes the cataract, but means that there's a lack of accommodation. Sometimes the retina can become detached. I had a little fear of this about a year and a half ago where I had a problem and it looked, I thought maybe I was getting a detached retina. Um, I got in to see my friend and neighbor, uh, the optometrist, who checked it. It turns out it wasn't, it was just a little inflammation. Um, but the retina tears away from the, the choroid. And the problem with that is the choroid is where the blood vessels are and the retina uses a lot of ATP. It needs a lot of oxygen. So it becomes ischemia. So the, the problem is that there's a very limited amount of time that you can, that those receptors, the rods and the cones, can live uh, away from the blood supply in the choroid. And so if it's not corrected right away, it's irreversible loss of those receptors and loss of vision. Um, there's no pain or discomfort with it. What happens is the visual field disappears in that area where it's, and so if the retina detaches, it's like a curtain is brought down over the eye. Vitreous humor gets behind the retina and pushes it further out, lifting it more of it away. And, they, and the cells just cease the function. So what has to happen is the retina has to be reattached. Now they can do it with lasers and, and literally just burn it into place and scar it so that it's, it, it stays attached. Um, but it is a very time sensitive thing. If you if you suspect the detached retina, it's not, oh, well, maybe I can get in uh, next week and have somebody look at it. This is go to eMERGE or go have a professional look at it as soon as possible. Okay, macular degeneration is called the Alzheimer's of the eye, right? It's usually age-related, uh, so it's AMD, uh, aged macular degeneration. And the macula is the, is the phobias and traumas. Um, there's environmental factors and there's predisposition. Uh, genetic predisposition to it. Um, there's two types. There's dry and wet. Uh, and what happens is the central vision becomes blurred and then lost. So what happens here is that the neural cells in the retina produce these waste proteins, the same as the neural cells in the brain will produce the plaques that become um, uh, Alzheimer's plaques. Now these things, a certain amount of, of this material is normal, but if it starts to be produced rapidly and, is, and accumulates, it can cause problems. Right? And 
so the 90% of people have the dry version of this. And these deposits form in the retinal cells. And so the cells stop functioning. And because it happens uh, in the cones more than the rods, it, it happens in this macula, in the fulvius centralis. So, so that central vision is what becomes blurred. Now, in the exudative or the wet type, what happens is that this almost becomes like a benign tumor. These, this stuff accumulates and then becomes vascularized. Uh, and so the wet which refers to the, to the fact that, that it becomes, there's capillaries from the, uh, that feed it. And uh, so it, it makes it come on much faster. It's a lot less common. Therapy, uh, up until recently, therapies didn't really work very much for it. It was an age-related thing, and people just had to accept that their vision was going. And I know quite a few elderly people that have basically become legally blind because of macular de degeneration. My wife's grandmother was one. Um, various other people that I've known for years. Um, and they lose their, their central vision. So if this is the picture of normal vision, this is what, what you look like. You see the two kids, you see the balls, you see, right? And you, you see the fence back here and this orange and this green. Somebody with macular degeneration sees this. So wherever you're looking at has this loss. The peripheral, not too bad. Some people can actually learn how to use this peripheral. So there are lenses that can move this and, and people can actually learn how to read and function. I won't even say reasonably well but better. And some of these therapies are, are, are involved with that. Um, in fact, most of the therapies until recently have been involved with that. Now they're looking at different things that, that are trying to stop this accumulation of these, <clears throat> these plaques. So that's it for the eyes. That's a, the hour on the eyes. And the next uh, video will be on ears.